Hello, St. James. I hope you've had a great week and I hope that you are enjoying this beautiful weekend. The crisp air is just absolutely uh, wonderful. What a great time to be outside and to enjoy all of this. Uh, and I encourage you to join us outside uh, today at 5 p.m. or Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, we will have our blessing in the animal service here at St. James at the far field. Uh, it, it will, it's a loved, loved, uh, long time tradition and, uh, we'll be able to have it almost exactly as we always do. Uh, just make sure to wear a mask. Uh, you can bring a lawn chair, but it's a short enough service that you don't need to. Uh, but we will have a chance to celebrate the breadth of God's creation and the beauty and, and joy we get from that creation. So please join us today at 5 p.m. And then next Sunday at 1015, now here the new time, not 830, but 1015, uh, we will worship uh, with Holy Eucharist out at Chapultepec. And I'm hoping that the new time uh, will not only uh, warm uh, the air a little bit, but also provide an opportunity for new people uh, that might have found 8.30 to be a little bit too early to come out and join us. It's a wonderful chance for us just to be together. Um, and it's it's wonderful to run into each other around town, uh, but there's something about gathering together as a worshiping body that... Um, that is so meaningful and, and those outdoor services and God's uh, wide open cathedral have been absolutely uh, sustaining to me. So I hope you could consider, uh, consider participating. Uh, I have some other good news uh, or it's sort of good news, but we uh, for at least a couple days uh, qualified here in Fauquier County, according to the, the, uh, the health tracker marker uh, and the benchmark for reopening uh, to reopen in person. Uh, we're not white there now, but at least for part of this week, we dipped uh, uh, below that benchmark. Uh, and so uh, if we continue to be vigilant and if we uh, encourage our community at large to continue, continue to be vigilant, uh, hopefully we can uh, stay under that level and we can get permission uh, for our reopening plan and we can regather here at St. James. I'd love nothing more than to have All Saints Sunday uh, here at St. Saint, Saint James. That's sort of a, a, a goal of mine. So I hope the the community at large can uh, can help meet that goal. So, uh, so we have something to work toward. Uh, also, as we move our outdoor worship to ten fifteen, uh, we will be moving the time of our uh, Christian formation, uh, both adults and, and children. So please check your calendars uh, and check your emails if you participate in those as well. Um, and uh, I believe ECW also is meeting. Uh, tomorrow on Monday. So uh, check your weekly email about that as well and get those details. Uh, also at 1015 today, uh, we have our virtual coffee hour. We'll alternate that with our outdoor uh, 1015 services. So we always have a, a, a way to connect each Sunday. And um, the link for that is in the weekly email. And I pray uh, that it works this, this Sunday and that we can just have a chance to check in, just 30 minutes, just to see how people are doing. So uh, drop in, you can drop in and drop out, but just a chance to uh, to be seen and to uh, say hello and, and hear what's going on in the life of your your, your parish family. So, uh, so that's a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, and with that, let us begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Hello, St. James family. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to say hello to you all from the Kane family. We miss you, and we look forward to returning to in-person worship soon. Um, in the meantime, we hope to see you around town outside and you know, get the chance to say hello and catch up. Um, we hope you're all well and staying safe, and hopefully we will see you soon. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Prayers of the People, Form 2. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops. 
Ben and Ted are clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our President, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for the victims and those fighting fires in the West and those affected by Hurricane Sally. We pray for Tom, Charlotte, Pat, Patty, Keith, Malia, Howard, Mary Lee, Karen, Helen, Carol, Bonnie, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. Pray for Sharon. I ask your prayers for all the health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope your healing and your love we pray this in the name of your son who came and dwelt among us jesus our lord amen a reading from the gospel according to matthew chapter 21 verses 33 to 46 jesus said Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. 
Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things I absolutely love about being an Episcopal priest, and it's not exclusive to the Episcopal Church, uh, but it is uh, a hallmark of our tradition uh, that, that we take a look at Scripture and we understand it in, uh, in its fullest context. Uh, we don't just shine a flashlight on the text and, um, and, and, and tell people to run with it. Uh, we invite them into the story in a very comprehensive way. What did it mean to those first hearers? We spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand what did the people that heard it the first time hear? Uh, what was the context? Uh, what, what was going on that, uh, that would have made this a fitting parable or a fitting story to tell? Uh, what political social tensions uh, were underfoot. Uh, and then what are the, the, the competing layers that Matthew, the, uh, the writer, is dealing with? What is he trying to convey uh, in, in, in the writing? Uh, and I think as we get those multiple layers, um, each gospel lesson is really uh, three different aspects of history. Uh, it's the moment that Jesus lived. It's the moment that Matthew uh, uh, preached and captured that. Uh, and it's the moment we live in today. And in each one of those lessons is ripe with those, the, those textures uh, that I think give it much deeper meaning. Uh, but sometimes it's better not to know. Today's gospel may be one of those. Uh, you see, the parable, the parable of the vineyard, uh, is on the heels of several other uh, encounters, uh, one of which we talked about last week, uh, between the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jesus. Uh, Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He's come in on a donkey, made his presence known, uh, come in on a little bit of, of uh, a reversal of the way that, uh, that Roman royalty would have entered the city. Uh, he came in through the backside of town, came in riding a donkey. Um, uh, when he came in, uh, he turned over the tables uh, of the money changers, uh, really uh, creating, um, creating quite a bit of havoc uh, and, and and getting well above the Roman radar and, um, and conflicting with the leadership of the temple community as it was. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees are not happy uh, and they are concerned and they want to stop this movement. 
Uh, and then the second encounter, which we talked about last week, uh, Jesus is in the temple and the Pharisees and Sadducees ask Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Uh, who's given you permission to come and turn everything upside down? Uh, we were not thriving necessarily, but we were uh, given permission to exist, which we were happy with. Uh, and and we, had, uh, we had a modicum of control uh, and, and religious freedom underneath that system. Don't wreck it and we had the back and forth about um well whose authority was john's and then the parable of the uh of the the two brothers uh neither of whose exemplary but one who said no i'm not going to do it but does it anyway and the other who said sure i'll do it and doesn't um and now here we are today so we have no ambiguity about who this parable is directed towards it is directed toward uh that first son who says he was going to do it and doesn't, uh, who says uh, that he was going uh, to, uh, uh, to do the work but hasn't done it, who's uh, going to be the church but hasn't fulfilled the wholeness of what the church has been asked to do. Um, and so this parable follows right in line, uh, and the Sadducees uh, and the Pharisees are hearing it very closely. Uh, and the parable goes a little bit like this. So this landowner has a vineyard. Now, no, as soon as we talk about a vineyard, uh, all of those images of a vineyard, of being the vine, all of those vineyard images in Scripture uh, pour over the listener. Uh, remember, back then, they didn't have uh, regular t TV, much less cable TV. Uh, they didn't have the, uh, the, the wealth of literature that we have now, and so the Bible was the first, second, third, and fourth thing these religious leaders uh, read. And so they all knew every story, every reference, um, as, if it was, um, as if it was the other side of their hand. Uh, and so when they heard the story of the vineyard, they went straight to Isaiah and all of the other passages about the vineyard. Um, and Jesus says, this landowner has a vineyard. And he gives the vineyard to these renters to take care of it, uh, to, to, to take care of the land, uh, to take care of the, the, the fruit, uh, and, um, and to give him a share of their produce or the proceeds from their produce each year. Uh, and, and so that's the agreement. And so uh, it works out okay. And then, uh, and then the landowner sends uh, a, a few of um, a, a few of his, uh, of his servants to go and, um, and collect the proceeds. And they're beaten and killed. And so the landowner sends another uh, crew of, of, of landowner, of, of servants, uh, to go and collect the money, and, um, and they do. Uh, and they also are beaten and killed and aren't able to collect the money. And so uh, the landowner, instead of sending the police, instead of sending the military, instead of taking all uh, of his resources uh, and shutting down the operation, he decides to send his son. And he sends his son to go there um, and collect what is rightfully his. It's his vineyard. And so the son goes and he is beaten and killed as well. And then after all of this, Jesus says, what do you think the landowner did? What do you think the landowner should do? The Sadducees and Pharisees who've been listening intently, um, they lean in and they say, you know what? That's awful. That's horrible. What are you talking about? Uh, that, that should never have happened. What a horrible group of runners. They should be killed unmercifully. There's no punishment great enough. And Jesus essentially says, no, it's not going to end that way. They're not going to all be destroyed. But you know what? The landowner is going to move them out and bring in new people, new people who can tend that vineyard the way that the landowner intended And then he directs it at the Pharisees and Sadducees. So there's no, uh, there's no question about what the meaning of this was. They had been given the incredible privilege, the responsibility of leading God's church. 
of conveying God's love for the marginalized, of practicing justice and righteousness. And instead, they practice self-service. And God said, it's not going to end that way. You can't be the renter, the, the, the caretaker of my vineyard if you don't practice exactly what the revelation of God is, uh, mercy, uh, love, uh, justice. In fact, in Isaiah, that passage about the vineyard talks about us bearing fruit. And it talks about a God who went in uh, expecting the church to practice justice and found blood poured out, went in seeking righteousness and heard cries of God's people. So over time, we've, we Christians have used that passage to understand uh, God saying, you know what? The Jews didn't quite get it right. They didn't quite know exactly uh, how to take care of that vineyard. So God threw them out and handed the vineyard to the Christians. And absolutely unthinkable things were done. I think one of the important things that we need to do as any people of faith is when we look at the scripture to remind ourselves who it is that is revealed in scripture, a God who is love, a God who is grace, a God who calls us not to use God's word as a weapon, not to use God's word to one up one other, but to use God's word to change our hearts, to mold our hearts more to be like the person or the entity that is God. And so read this passage again with those eyes. Where is the good news? Uh, where is the invitation to live more divinely? I see two things. One, uh, I see an important message about the nature of God. The landowner is pretty ridiculous. I mean, who would send uh, more servants after the first servants were beaten and killed? But God loves them. And when you're in love with somebody, uh, you are so uh, committed to being in relationship that you will do anything to preserve that relationship. Uh, you don't want to send the police. You don't want to destroy them uh, because you love them, because you want desperately uh, to figure out how you can stay in a relationship with these wayward people. And Jesus describes a God who does that. So God, again, sends more of his servants, and they're beaten and killed. And God still says, I love you, and I want to work this out. I want us to figure out how we can uh, be in relationship together, how we can uh, be God and people the way that I made you all to be in relationship with me. And so he sent his son, a testament to his love for us. He sent his son. And even after his son was killed, God didn't say game over. God didn't destroy all those who would do such heinous things to his beloved son. Because we are his beloved children too. So it tells us about a God whose nature is so relational, so loving, uh, that there is no end that we could go to uh, to crush that. Which as we look at the world today, uh, and we see the, the, the brokenness. We see the things that we're doing to one another. We see the, uh, the anger that we have towards our fellow brothers and sisters. It is incredibly sustaining and life-giving to know that we are made by a God who has that kind of relentless, ridiculous, unlimited love for us. And the second bit of grace I get from this story what does it mean? What does it mean uh, to be part of, uh, of somebody called to tend the vineyard? Anybody who knew uh, what had been written about the vineyard knew that bearing fruit, uh, that the work of uh, the vineyard, the work of those caring for the vineyard was to do justice, was to seek righteousness. That the antithesis of that was when blood was spilled needlessly, 
when cries of God's people went unmet. So when I read this, I see a God begging us, begging us to ask that deeper question. What are we doing as the church? What are we doing to seek a more just and perfect world? What are we doing to heed the call of God's crying children? So it's the grace of knowing the nature of our God who we follow that is so completely love uh, that there is no end that God wouldn't go. And there is that challenge, that responsibility, uh, that job description of the church to bear fruit to bear fruit of justice, to respond to injustice, to hear the cries of God's people and to heed them, to be God's answer, to be God's relentless love to the world. So even in this passage, which might have started off as a challenge to the Pharisees and Sadducees, there is grace. Because with God, there is always grace. Amen. Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Hallelujah. Be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.